So, hello and welcome to everybody. Welcome to Craft School Material World in partnership with the Eden Project. It's so wonderful to have you here and to see so many of your names on the screen. Uh, my name is Melissa de Jamal and I am the Education Manager here at the Crafts Council. And in the next hour and a half, here's a little overview of what we will cover. Uh, you'll hear from um, me a little bit about Craft School and Material World for this year. Bran Howell, the Education Specialist at the Eden Project, will tell us about all the all-important work done at the Eden Project in collaboration. And we will have a Make First Pedagogy presentation by our Learning and Participation um, uh, Head of Learning and Participation, Zoe. Uh, we'll also have a maker, an educator, Chris Webb, He'll be doing a hands-on activity with us, so make sure you've got your resources. And we will hear from last year's Key Stage 3 winners, uh, Sonia from Belfair's Academy. And there'll also be some time at the end for a quick Q&A. Q uh, um, and our wonderful Learning and Sector Support Coordinator, Faith, will keep an eye on the chat throughout. So if you have any questions, please do engage with our chat feature. So the Crafts, Crafts Council. We are the UK's national charity for craft, and we believe that the craft skills and knowledge enriches and uplifts not only us as individuals, but collectively as society and the world. And we do this through um, different avenues. We support craft makers and their businesses. We manage the Crafts Council collection. We present exhibitions uh, in our gallery space in London, and we publish a crafts magazine where we feature lots of inspiring stories uh, about crafts, crafts making across the globe. And we run the learning and participation program for all age groups, and that's Craft School. Craft School is our annual nationwide challenge to get schools making. This is a free program aimed at education providers and learners from Key Stage 1 all the way to Key Stage 4. And uh, this year, we have noticed that the climate emergency continues to be at the top of our agenda for schools and young people. So we have, uh, for the second year running, partnered up with the, education, uh, the Eden Project to challenge learners to explore the impact of climate change on everyday life through craft. Now, Bran, I'd like to introduce uh, you from the Eden Project, uh, and he'll be talking to us a little bit more about the Eden Project and why the work that we do is so important. Thank you, Bran. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, so I should say I'm one of the education specialists at Eden. I'm one of a big giant team of young uh, people who work with young people in a formal educational setting all over the world. We welcome about 40,000 students a year to do face-to-face -face work and we work with over another 80,000 young people online. So in total last year we spoke to 110-ish thousand young people. Um, and uh, so Obviously, we get asked to do a lot of this sort of thing and we're working in partnership with lots of other projects and things. But we chose uh, this one because it's a particularly wonderful and special project. And so it's, uh, it's a great honour to be here and to, to talk to you. And it, you know, it's such a brilliant project that uh, I'm really looking forward to working with you over the next year on uh, uh, all the adventures that we're going to go on. Um, so I thought I could give you a quick sort of summary of the Eden project, just so that give you an idea of why we think it's such a great, idea, uh, such a great project. Uh, and uh, I also want to say that you know there's uh, loads and loads of resources all over our uh, website, and so we've got lots of uh, lesson plans and ideas and all sorts of training and things. So do have a look on our website uh, in the learn section because um, we are um, always busy. So the previous picture you just saw was Eden Project 26 years ago, and uh, we bought a giant clay pit. It was full of nothing, no soil, nothing. And you might think that's the worst place in the world to build a greenhouse. Well, that was the point, because we want to show people that actually nature can always bounce back if you work with it uh, and if you apply creativity and passion. Um, and uh, so we worked from that to turn it into what you see in the slides now. Um, it's a beautiful spot. We have the world's biggest greenhouse full of tropical plants uh, and uh, amazing fruits and uh, 
flowers, all sorts of pieces. We've also got a, another giant um, greenhouse full of uh, plants from the Mediterranean regions, uh, which is full of all the things that you'd recognise if you go on holiday. But more than that, we're more than just plants. We're about um, getting together and celebrating the world, celebrating the beauty, celebrating each other, uh, playing, having fun and having a really uh, sort of well, we, we really firmly believe that there's no point in saving the planet if we're all going to sit around being miserable of it. So that's the approach that Eden Project has. So next slide, please. So here's our mission. Uh, and you'll notice that even though we are a sort of an environmental eco uh, business attraction, uh, we're mainly interested in people. You know, we want to point out that actually people are nature as well and we're all together in this mess uh, and nature has done a really good job of working and uh, looking after us right from the moment we were tiny little cells in puddles um, and it's been there throughout our sort of history of life really looking after us giving us all the things that we need and that's essentially what the world does um, <clears throat> But unfortunately, you don't have to look hard and far to find uh, nature in trouble. And if we don't return the favour and start looking after it, then life is going to become considerably harder for all of us. Uh, and so that's the point. That's why we're here. We want to point out, A, how wonderful it is, B, how it's in trouble, and C, how we can help it uh, together and as individuals. Um, and next slide, please. So that's what we're up to. Um, we are nature. We breathe it. We wear it, we eat it, uh, we rely on it for everything. And so without it, we're in trouble. And we do that using uh, sculpture and art and music and passion. We're interested in people's emotions. Uh, you can't change people's minds with just facts. We know that. So we're here to get to people's hearts as well as their heads and then give them the tools to work with their hands to do something about it. And that's why we love this work project so much. Next slide, please. Um, because that's what we do. You know, we're all about beauty. We're all about celebration. We're about giving young people a really great time and telling fantastic stories. We're about getting young people muddy in their playgrounds where they've been told to stay off the grass. And we're about showcasing what wonderful, beautiful things people can do if they're given the opportunity. And that's why we love working with the Craft Council. Uh, I've got one more slide and not much time, so I'm gonna whip to the next one, please. And I could go on about this all day. Why would we want to work with the Craft Council? Well, the, the list goes on and on. But basically, we're here because um, this project enables young people to experiment and make mistakes, to be brave and be ambitious and be um, playful and fun. And we believe that we're not actually going to save any of the problems we face unless young people grow up learning those skills. And so this project is an absolute winner for that and uh, and we love it so hopefully i will get to talk to you uh, either individually or as a group again my email is freely available uh, and you can get in touch with me anytime if you've got anything you want to ask uh, and uh, my role will sort of evolve throughout this sort of year so i'm going to stop now before i run out of time there we go on time <laughs> that's fantastic thank you hmm. So yes, together with the Eden Project, we have shaped um, learners to respond to these three briefs. So we have three themes that we would like learners to respond to. Uh, the first one, renewable materials. So encouraging learners to use materials that they find around them, materials from nature to use, to make, uh, creating and mending. So mending and combining materials to give them a brand new life, reclaim and reuse to save materials that would otherwise go to waste um, and yeah, breathing in new fresh life into things that would otherwise be disposed. So these are our main three themes. And everything that we do is underpinned by our Make First pedagogy. Um, so I'm gonna now hand over to Zoe. Uh, the Head of Learning and Participation at the Crafts Council, and she's going to talk to us a little bit more about the all-important Make First approach. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's very exciting um, to be here at the beginning of um, Craft School Material World. This is the second year that we've run the challenge and some absolutely amazing work was made um, last year by pupils um, well, learners in all sorts of different educational settings. So I should say that that Craft School welcomes schools, but we also work with youth clubs, with children's centres, with a whole range of different organisations, anyone who works with young people aged five to 16. Um, and we ask that 
learners spend um, a, a period of time just making, making in response to those themes. So it's all about working hands on with materials. Um, and craft school is very much underpinned by something that we call Make First, which is quite grandly referred to as our craft education pedagogy, but is really just an approach to, to craft and to craft in schools. And Make First draws on lots of experience that we've built over the past kind of 10 years or so of delivering craft education with schools, so working with teachers and with learners directly. And we spent a long time thinking about what what was really magical about those experiences and um, what the really special thing is about craft, so about making with 3D materials and um, kind of really getting hands on in that way. How is it different to a design approach or an art approach and really drilling down into that? Um, and we came up with with Make First. Um, so Make First also draws, I should say, quite a lot in early years practice and also draws on on a kind of art school approach. So we find it really interesting when we talk to teachers from across educational phases that this kind of playful, open ended approach um, is really embedded in our practice with under fives and also really embedded at higher education, but often there isn't much space for it I mean, the kind of years in between. So that's part of what Craft School tries to do is kind of to bring back an, an open ended, non linear learner led approach to craft in the classroom. Um, just thinking if there's anything else to cover here before you go into the next slide. Um, so I guess just to mention a little also a little bit that um, make first tries to embed a lot of um, well tries to embed an anti-racist approach and an anti-ableist approach and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that later on um, but basically what's really special I think about make first is it looks about the journey of the learner um, and how the young people we work with can I can um, kind of develop their own identities as craftspeople so I think that's really key to remember as we just go through some kind of um, of the features of the pedagogy. I think you can move on to the next slide now. Great. So essentially Make First is all about diving straight into making, picking your materials and having a go. So we found that often teachers we were working with when they looked at 3D making with their learners would start perhaps with a design process. So they might start by doing some initial ideas, some sketching, and then they would progress onto um, making with materials and perhaps produce a final piece. So it was quite a, often quite a linear process, quite a design led process. And we really wanted to encourage teachers and learners to think about just having a go with materials um, in the first instance. So getting material, 3D materials into the hands of young people at the earliest opportunity and then seeing what happens. Next slide, please, Mel. Oh, hang on. I'm just going to line up my notes with the slides. Yeah, so Make First is, is playful and open ended. It's all about enjoying the making and not focusing on the final outcome. So we also found that um, Often teachers and learners were quite product focused. So it was an, about creating a final piece, but we really wanted to encourage people to just enjoy the process, um, to enjoy that making process and see what happens. So introducing that kind of element of uncertainty back into the work again. And that often means that learners end up with very different outcomes um, compared to their colleagues in the class. And that that can be really exciting and sometimes a little bit intimidating for teachers but we're there to hold your hands through this process so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that next slide please so yeah as i've kind of um, mentioned in the intro make first is very learner driven so it's very much about pupils making the decisions about their work as they go um we see this as a really exciting opportunity to invite pupils to kind of bring their whole selves, their cultural identities to the work that they're going to make. Um, so thinking about how young people themselves relate to craft, um, to the elements of making that they might have experienced at home and, and to bring that to their work and to think about critically about all sorts of different issues about how they connect with the world. And that's why we were so excited about being able to tackle this really big theme of sustainability. Um, because it's obviously something that young people are really thinking about a lot. It's really, really important to them. And craft can be a really interesting way of 
unpicking some of those big issues in a very hands-on way. So we were really interested to see what the outcome might be of young people kind of tackling a big theme like sustainability through their work. Uh, I think we also wanted to highlight here the really exciting opportunity for craft to be a tool for kind of decolonizing an art, craft and design curriculum um, that has um, historically been um, kind of uh, dominated by, by perhaps white artists has been quite Eurocentric. Um, the resources that we put together for craft school material world, world really try and look at a broad range of makers and that they're hopefully uh, makers that uh, are really kind of diverse learners can identify with um, and um, can bring a different perspective to their work. Um, so it's the kind of craft school material world has very much been designed to have a kind of global focus and you'll see that as you go through the resources for the challenge. Uh, next slide please. So Makefest is very much about tweaking and tinkering with materials to develop their ideas. So we often talk about this as um, being craft thinking or thinking through making. Um, so we want learners to perhaps pick something up, have a go, find that it doesn't quite work and choose a different avenue to, to kind of tackling that and, and end up with a, pro a product that they didn't expect. So again, that kind of um, embracing the uncertain and the unexpected. Next slide, please, Mal. And again, we wanted to disrupt that linear process of making. So we found that when makers talk to us about their process and how they work, and you'll see this um, in some of our video resources that we've made to support this year's challenge, makers talking about how they'll perhaps pick up a piece of work, um, start doing, start, start working on it, find it's not quite working, start something else, have several pieces of work that they're making at the same time. Um, so, so making becomes this kind of iterative process. Um, so we wanted to encourage, encourage that, that element of making as well. Next slide, please, Mel. And this is all to do with um, building resilience in our learners. So we found that um, often teachers were saying to us, oh, the, one of the most challenging things about working with my classes is that they're really scared to fail. Um, and I think this is to do with all sorts of pressures that young people are under. Um, but we wanted to really use craft as being a safe space to practice failing and to build that resilience. And we find that when we talk to makers, again, they often talk about how um, making is a really key part of their process. So trying something that doesn't work out, they see as being really, really important part of the way that they work. And we wanted to um, just make this really clear and, and celebrate this in a way that but failing, trying again, failing better, failing in a different way um, can be a really exciting way of making. Next slide, please, Mel. So Make First is very much about learning together as a community. Um, and we see this come through in all sorts of different ways in craft school. So we have some young people who work together um, and submit work together to the challenge. Um, we always encourage people to think about different ways they can work collaboratively within their classes. So can you encourage your learners to perhaps start a piece of work that they swap with somebody else in the class? Um, Make First really creates those opportunities to move beyond the idea of you just having your one piece of work that you work on in isolation. So. Um, can we make together as a community in the class? I think we see the whole of the craft school challenge as a community and there's a really lovely moment um, at the end of the year when we have our celebration where we bring all those schools together to celebrate the work that makers that, that learners have made across the year. So yeah, very much thinking of learn of making as a kind of collaborative process. Next one, please, Mel. Yeah, and this is all, I think, underpinned by the idea that as we work with materials, we're building skills and knowledge um, that is haptic. So it's skills and knowledge that we've developed through our interactions with the physical world. So it's all that really important stuff that we find is often missing from classrooms as we know that um, opportunities for hands-off making become fewer and further between um, and perhaps uh, learning becomes more screen-based. Um, that we want children to have the opportunity to really develop um, an understanding of how clay works and how to add moisture to clay as you work or thinking about all the different ways that you can fold paper. Um, so it's those um, skills and, and kind of fine motor skills and understanding of materials that you can only really develop through that really hands-on making process. 
yeah and finally and i think most importantly make first is all about the joyfulness and pleasure that comes with making so we want craft school to be a really joyful experience for children and young people and teachers not to say that it's not challenging sometimes and i think um kind of frustration and challenge is very much a part of making um but i think we really wanted to celebrate the kind of pleasure that can come from having that time to make with our hands uh, so yeah that's uh, the kind of final slide on those those um building blocks of make first um so i guess just to say that um make first really underpins craft school um and it's really important because it um is part of the way that we we judge the the winners of the challenge i think everybody will try not to talk about winning um too much because i think the challenge is really about taking part but it is very much part of the judging criteria that we put forward and that is in your um that is in your resources that support the challenge. So we are really looking for young people to take risks with their work. Um, we're looking to see that learners have developed their work as a maker and that we can see young people's own personal um, kind of decisions and judgments and beliefs and interests really shining through in the work that they've, they've submitted to us, that we can see learners bringing their whole selves to their work. Um, so it is very, very key to the challenge as a whole. Um, but I think finally, there's just a few slides that talk a little bit about practically what does this look like in the classroom or um, in a school setting? Because I think often, although this kind of learner learner driven approach and open ended approach is very key to um, the way lots of us work and the way that lots of art specialists work with their students. Um, increasingly, I think there's there's less and less room for it within schools and schools are not really set up to work in this way. So I think it can seem really challenging um, and a little bit scary. And we often have teachers who say, well, brilliant, I'm used to working like this with a small group of people, but I want to do craft school with my whole class. What does this look like with a class of 30 children? How can I make this work practically? Um, so next slide, please, Mel. So I think just to reassure everybody that although it's a very open approach and it is about um, kind of pupils deciding which routes they want to go down and which materials they want to use and how they want to use them, it doesn't have to be a complete free for all. Um, and there are lots of different ways that you can scaffold Make First with different resources, with challenges for your students um, that make it a lot more manageable. So, I mean, the, the briefs within craft school themselves are, um, a, a resource that you that you can use to scaffold make first. So taking one of those briefs as a starting point will very much help to guide work and will help to kind of hold lots of students in, in a manageable place in terms of the work that they're developing. Um, I feel like there's important bits in here that I don't want to miss out. Um, and I think the other thing to say is that although it's very much about exploring materials. That's not to say that you can't be very specific in the materials that you offer to your learners. So you don't have to provide a huge number of, of resources and materials. Um, you could just have learners only working with paper or only working with clay or whatever it is that you have to hand. And in fact, particularly this year, we're really thinking about sustainability as part of the challenge. And again, about renewable materials, materials that you can gather in your local environment outside, recycled materials so things that you can source uh, locally and reuse in your making so it doesn't have to involve lots and lots of um, resources and hopefully it doesn't have to involve you buying lots of stuff um, it's definitely something that we want to move away from as well so throughout the CPD sessions as part of craft school um, there will be lots of input from um, from craft council staff from the artists and makers that we work with who will support you in terms of developing skills around Make First and feeling really confident to develop, to deliver this with your students. Next one, Mel. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about um, collaboration. I think this slide is in here just to remind us to um, encourage people to think about their classroom environments as they deliver Make First. I think craft school can be a really exciting opportunity to step away from perhaps your the classroom setup that you use usually to rearrange tables, to encourage students to work together. Um, so I think that's um, that's that one. Last slide. Yeah. 
And I think this is particularly true of craft school this year and our wonderful sustainability theme, um, but that this kind of hands-on making approach through Make First can support a whole range of learning outcomes across the curriculum. So obviously wonderful outcomes in terms of science-based learning this year. Um, but I think um, we'll, we are also always aware that um, hands-on making can support um, students to talk about their work in a really exciting way can it can support in exciting writing opportunities and kind of yeah all sorts of opportunities across the curriculum I think that's everything I think I've taken up much too much time as well Mal sorry <laughs> that's perfect thank you so much Zoe Okay, now the moment we've all been waiting for. I'm so excited to introduce our maker for today, Chris Webb, who will be leading us in a hands-on activity underpinned by our Make First pedagogy. Uh, Chris is a museum practitioner, educator and artist who works in museums and galleries and other cultural settings. And it's a real privilege to have you here today with us, Chris. So Chris, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here kind of got a multi um, device setup. Um, so bear with me as we, we get settled in. Um, I'm going to share a couple brief examples of my work. Um, so if you haven't gathered any materials uh, for the sort of hands on part of today, now is a great opportunity to sort of pull what you might have um, around you. The, the workshop, the activity is not a kind of do as I do type workshop. It's about pulling from whatever materials and tools are within your reach. So um, that might be paper, recycled materials, uh, fabric, magazines, scraps of whatever you can find. I have a big layout of um, scraps and things that I've gathered, but you don't need a big variety. It's about having um, an opportunity to play with whatever's in front of you. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about my approach to making and then um, uh, that gives you a moment to gather materials and then we'll get right into it. Um, so as as uh, Melissa said, I work in a range of settings and I'm really interested in um, making generally. Um, my focus tends to be around textiles, but um, I'm more interested uh, in how craft is a tool for exploring ideas, for slowing us down, um, for having reflective conversations. Um, I'm really interested in the the idea, the concept of sort of craftsmanship, and I know that's a sort of needlessly gendered word, so maybe craft personship or craft folkship, depending on how, what you might want to call it, but just the idea that every person has an independent practice um, and that we measure our practice against our own skills and how they developed, and it's a kind of ever ongoing journey, much like uh, teachers and educators, you're always revisiting your practice, reflecting on your practice. There's a nice parallel there, I think, between the way that makers work um, and educators work. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll just give two quick examples of my work. Um, this example and, and sort of how this process surfaces in my work. This example um, is a piece of work I did with the Welcome Collection. It was um, a sleep quilt project and it was inspired by an exhibition that looked at consciousness and sleep. Um, they commissioned me to to work with people and invite them to share stories um, and their experience of sleep. Everything from like dreams, sleepwalking, um, positive and negative relationships sleep. We I heard stories about like sleep paralysis and and quite complex health issues related to sleep. Um, but then through a process of kind of slow stitching and embroidery, people sat down with their stories and. Um, and sort of turn them into a, something that could be visually represented and, and discussed. Um, if you go to the next slide, these are just some images of people working. And, and the process really slowed people down, gave, gave people time to discuss and examine their stories, compare and contrast their stories uh, to other people, and um, kind of spend time with their stories. And, and together, these came into um, a digital and physical quilt, um, which was sort of indexed and layered with these different um, stories, but using it as a as a platform to have dialogue and, and share ideas. And then the next um, slide, 
that's just that's just when we started putting the piece together um pulling um all the different stories into one one quilt which was then sort of digitized online the other project i wanted to highlight is more of a personal project um this this quilt i made shot i called shot on an iphone 6 um it's a quilt which was inspired um from kind of observing all the geographic data that was collected passively on my phone over the course of a year. So everywhere I went, everywhere I walked, where I tapped in and out of TFL system, where I spent money, um, I, I looked at that data from the perspective of how it presented on my phone and was sort of overwhelmed. So I improvised um, using a sort of improvisation technique, created a map, and then uh, spent time with that data, stitching it into um, the map of the area I covered within a year. So everywhere I walked, every bus journey, every tube station, um, it it's just a way of sitting with information and, and slowing down and exploring it, thinking about the comfort, um, my comfort with generating all this data, <laughs> the impact on my privacy, you know, the impact on the environment that somewhere there's a CPU or a, a, the cloud is running burning energy to store this data is it, is it even needed um but it also gave me an interesting way to look at like a picture of my year and the patterns um I explore and to me it's far more interesting than looking at a spreadsheet or looking at an infographic um so any any opportunity to kind of sit with ideas and visualize them and, and physically make them into being is something I'm always really interested in um, which brings me to this um, this activity um, for exploring Make First. Um, so if you don't, if um, you're able to pin the camera that my hands are in now, if you can spotlight that, um, that should help us sort of follow along. I think it's just coming. I'm, I'm going to just keep going because I'm assuming it's spotlit um, and... I can't quite see, there we go. I can't quite see for myself because I have so many screens open. But um, yeah, like I said, this is not a do as I do workshop. Uh, this is everybody, whatever you're working with will come up with something different. Um, I have gathered a range of materials here, some textiles, felts, things that are very much my go-to, um, scraps and things that uh, I keep, keep in my uh, stash, in my cupboard. Um, I have some things that are a little more out of my regular comfort zone. I've got some um, plastic bags, some some forage material. I've got some sweet wrappers from um, a journey I made recently, having sweets along the way. Um, it doesn't matter what you have. Um, whatever you have will work. And um, what I'm going to do is is talk talk you through a kind of introduction to make first practically. Um, and then I'll I'll do some making and narrate that and sort of swap between that and and giving some prompts. But what I suggest is um, with the materials in front of you, just have a look at what you have and follow your um, follow your senses, your interest instinctively. Like what do you want to touch? Um, what do you want to explore the properties of? This. I'm being really led to um, these materials over here, which is the plastic bags, which um, has a real like sound sensory element to it. And in contrast, the kind of smoothness of this um, sort of sheen, shiny um, fabric. This um, workshop draws on something that's within the teacher's resources, the, the sort of first lesson that we suggest around introducing make first is a kind of free make. And that's in um, one of the sections of the teacher resource section 5.2. Um, there are still lots of ways, like Zoe said, to embed make first. Um, but this is just a way to introduce before you talk about the briefs, before you talk about um, the um, challenges, all those different things, um, to just start to think about how you, how you might use materials or how you might develop techniques that you then later apply to craft school. But I know like when someone puts paper in front of you and says, draw something, or someone puts a microphone in front of you and says, give a speech, it can be quite overwhelming. Um, so we've outlined in the resources and, and, and I'll go through here some prompts that you could follow. So 
you know, start to handle materials and look at their properties. I, I was thinking I have these, this paper here, which is very, um, which are sort of um, images used for collage, scraps of them left over from other workshops. And um, they tear, this tears quite easily. And so one of the things I was thinking while I was sitting here, waiting to get started, listening in on the um, uh, introductions was how easily this might tear, but how some of the fabrics and other materials don't, um, not so easily. Um, so, so playing with and thinking about, well, what do you need to do uh, to be able to manipulate materials? Once I give this a cut, much easier to tear and play with. And attached to that is um, the sort of satisfaction of changing the material, as well as the um, satisfaction of the sound of, of tearing. Um, I also have some of this double gauze here. It's a, it's a scrap of fabric. And something I never noticed about it before is, well, or never really thought about before was that um, it, it literally is two layers of gauze. But um, I when I realized that, I really just wanted to sort of tear and explore and pull the, the layers apart and kind of deconstruct. So um, I'm just sort of <laughs> narrating uh, what I'm doing. But I think the, the prompt is inviting your pupils to kind of handle materials, explore their properties, what things fold and stretch, um, what things bend easily or, or not? Um, how can you use the tools that you have in front of you to kind of interact with them? Um, what sounds do they make? Because this one's very ASMR in terms of um, the, the, the lovely crinkling sound and then different plastic bags with different textures make um, different sounds. Um, but what I'm, what I'm sort of, what I'm sort of tempted to do by this is to play a little bit with the fabrics I have in front of me, especially some of these ones that are a bit more, um, uh, transparent and kind of play with kind of tearing and then layering them. And I have these lovely embroidery hoops, um, which can be used with all sorts of materials, but one really nice thing about them is they create tension. Um, so you can sort of weave and layer materials and then use the hoop to then apply, um, to hold them in place and then apply uh, tension. So I'm gonna just, as I'm talking, play with some some layering of these different materials, almost like weaving um, different layers through and um, try and stretch it over one of these um, hoops. In the meantime, um, as you start to assess and play with the materials that you're, you have in front of you, um, you can think about how you might want to combine things. If, if there's two things that stand out um, and, and catch your eye. Is there a way to combine them? Is, is there a way to play with them? Um, what, what might you do? How might they fit together? What are the, um, the contrasts, uh, resistances of different materials? Some materials may not play well together or naturally fit well together. Um, I've just played a little bit with pulling the tension on this and then I'm going to um, tighten it up I realize now looking at the screen, the um, the colors are a lot more vivid in real life than on my um, uh, than my iPhone allows them to look. So apologies if it's looking a bit bland. But like I said, this isn't about making something or making um, something even beautiful. It's about uh, creating and playing and maybe developing a technique or an idea that you revisit uh, as with your class as part of their journey through craft school. I'd invite make um, pupils to think about what materials they're really drawn to as well. And also it's, it's often useful to think about the origins of materials, um, materials like 
plastic bags or um, materials that we come across every day seem ordinary, but there can be beauty in that. Um, equally bringing images from home, things that represent your family, um, your lived experience, things that in any other context might be ordinary, uh, but in this context could be, um, in this context, uh, used as an art material could bring something more beautiful or something different or elevate that material, I think is a really interesting provocation in terms of inviting people to see their own stories, their own traditions, um, what they engage with on a daily basis as valuable in, in an arts and cultural context. Um, so yeah, I've played a little bit and I've got this strange kind of concoction of um, threads and materials here. Um, so I'm gonna start to uh, do some stitching with it. And um, just going back to that thing about, you know, what um, attracts your attention, what um, draws your interest, there's something about these little sort of matchstick um, pieces of uh, either birch or balsam that I, completely forgot I've had. I've probably had them for 10 years in a, in a um, cupboard. And when I was unpacking them today for this workshop, I just had this urge to like wrap them and stitch them in thread. Um, I don't think it's gonna, it's nothing groundbreaking. It's nothing um, particularly aesthetically pleasing, but uh, it's an idea <laughs> and it's something to play with. And if you have that idea, you should follow it and maybe you you take an element of that idea into what you do next. Um, this is really just about experimenting and trial trial and error. So I'm going to play with that a little bit. While we are while I'm doing that, I'm going to keep sort of talking, um, but we're kind of at the midway point of this activity. So I'd be interested to hear um, if you want to share in the chat or if anyone um, from the team sort of stitching along and, and making along um, what what you're working with, if there's anything you're making or holding in front of you that you're surprised has caught your interest or anything that um, you gave a second thought to, you weren't sure about whether you could make use of it, um, if you have any observations or there's anything you're particularly working on, please feel free to, to share in the chat. Um, but I'm going to just keep going <laughs> um, and, and sort of keep chatting away. Um, but yeah, there's something about these little matchsticks that I really wanted to like envelope in thread and uh, just sort of wrap and, um, and stitch. And part of it, I think is just, thinking, oh, I have this one small, but very resistant material compared to everything else on my table. What could I do with that? I can't, um, I don't have a, or I could break it, but I don't have like a hammer or um, pliers or a knife to split it apart or to shape it. Um, but then I thought, oh, well, there's something I could do around wrapping or kind of, um, exploring and and making use of the resistance of it to create a kind of encased type um, piece um, in my stitching. And within that, I can play with, I guess, different angles or different arrangements. Um, the value of this is really just about making for the sake of making. And then um, as we share and start to hear what other people are doing. And if we were all in the same place around a table, we might start to borrow ideas from each other or think, oh, that's really interesting. Um, you know, this reminds me of this and that and, and start to make connections. I can see um, Charlotte's just said, I've been playing with a running stitch and how it gathers, layering the gathers and scrunching the materials, um, how it distorts the fabric making the textile become dimensional. I love that. I like I I've gone down this temptation of like, well, how do I create tension and make it flat? Um, but yeah, there are so many ways of 
um, running stitches or or creating um, patterns that make make fabrics three D, give them structure, um, something like something like this um, bag. I need to stop scrunching the bag while I'm talking, um, but it's just so uh, lovely and sensory to play with the bag. Um, but there's something about um, the 3D-ness of some of these materials and especially this one, which caught my eye at first, even just like sitting here, it just takes these lovely 3D shapes and there are definitely ways to structure and stitch that into place um, as well as ways to, to work against that if you want something flat or different. So thank you uh, for that. Thank you for um, contributing that thought, Charlotte. Chris, I, I can hope. share mine. Yeah, please do. So I found, um, I'm at home today, so I went and grabbed my daughter's box of, miscel of like miscellaneous craft items. And in it, I found all these little bits of paper that she's made with my mum when she was staying last week. And I think my daughter's drawn some purple on it and she's made my mum right around the edge. I think this is purple spaghetti for my tea. And I liked the statement. And I suppose it's just nice. I, I get find these little bits of paper all the time and I never know what to do with them, but I can never quite bring myself to throw them away. Mm. So it made me think that it would be nice to reclaim them. So I've just sewed, I'm just sewing onto some felt um, and I'm not sure what I'll do with it next. But I liked the colour combination as well, of the yellow and the purple. I love that. And I think that that's, brings up something really interesting in that you know, we're encouraging people to make, sometimes making generates waste <laughs> in that we use materials to make, but also, um, you know, something that's made or is um, seemingly just a passing thought or a passing scrap. Um, it's hard to throw them, them away sometimes. Or it's hard to know what to do with them in terms of, especially um, when, you know, children bring homework or um children who are sort of prolific makers and are constantly making new things but yeah things like that that could be um little treasured moments repurposed and brought into a piece of making um or um or added reused as a material or kind of collaged or worked into um into a new piece of work kind of gives them new life but also gives them a, the sort of respect that you want to give something special like that. Um, uh, yeah, I really love that. Thank you for sharing that. I can just see in the chat, Keely um, saying, you found an envelope full of random keys and fobs and a pair of diamante earrings. Wow. Um, but yeah, using paper clips and drawing pins to stitch pieces together. It's, it's, um, it's just as interesting to create something that may not hold, may not last. And then you learn from that experience of what did and didn't work. Um, so yeah, I love that idea of exploring how a paperclip could be used to hold things together. How effective is that? How, um, how permanent is that or not? Because it's all learning that can be brought into your, um, your final work. I'm just gonna thread this needle and do a little more stitching. Now, if you were doing this with your class, this kind of, that kind of midway point, and, and it doesn't have to be um, a long, long session, but that kind of midway point of sharing is a really nice moment to um, share ideas, observe techniques. Um, there, this, wrapping and playing with stitching that I'm doing is reminding me of um, two things. One, um, well, actually three things. <laughs> One, um, uh, an exhibition I saw once where, uh, and I am very bad at remembering artists' names, but where an artist wrapped um, hundreds and hundreds of objects in copper wire and created these beautiful, beautiful pieces. Um, it also reminds me of, um, a maker called Esna Sue, who I think her work might be referenced in some of the resources where she's created these um, 
almost like leather sculptures that were wrapped around objects that have been taken away that sort of represent items lost um, or items that could have been carried but weren't carried by people um, leaving their homes or, or seeking refuge or asylum seeking. Um, and then on a much more trivial light note, it reminds me of um, as a child making bracelets out of like telephone wire and sort of wrapping and winding and winding wire. But just those three thoughts could could take this my ideas in a completely different direction. And I'm sort of having this dialogue with myself right now because um, we all can't come off mute and sh and show each other on screen what we're doing. Um, but um, I just want to highlight the the kind of ideas, the way that ideas start to come forward, and the places that just an open kind of free making activity um, could take you. Um, so we've got a few more minutes left. I'm going to actually. Um, drawing from what um, Zoe shared, I'm going to take some paper items and sort of play with stitching some paper into my work. And I, I'm going to cut this paper with my fabric scissors, even though that's kind of um, found terrible, <laughs> very terrible and frowned upon. But I did not plan enough to have a pair of non-fabric scissors in front of me today. Um, now, this isn't like a precious piece of work, um, but it is just a scrap um, of a building. And it, it could be a note from a loved one. It could be a piece of artwork, but I'm going to just play with it. Um, there's something about the structure of the building and the lines and that connects with the um, matchstick kind of shapes and actually scale and space that kind of jumped out at me so I'm just going to play with this next and and like I said I'm not I'm not setting out to create something that is beautiful or gallery worthy or prize winning right this is just about exploring the materials and developing confidence in making um but as you continue um to do this work as you might facilitate this with your class inviting them to share those ideas um not as like a as a critique but to observe each other's work and it's really powerful to to be able to look at something and say you know oh that um that thing you've done there it made me think of this did it make you think of this and then it might take that work in another direction or the person making the observation might want to borrow from that technique and take it in their own direction. Or they might want to form a pair and um, explore that a bit further. Um, and, and, and so having these moments to kind of pause, share, um, we, we have some prompts in the resource, which are just really simple um, statements like, you know, I picked up this material because um because and then fill in the blank because it it gave me structure and i wanted to play with the texture of it or you know now when i touch these pieces um it feels like sort of texture and um and almost like mark making and that makes me think of drawing like i'm i'm effectively drawing with thread rather than drawing with uh, pen and paper. Um, but those simple prompts can hopefully spark some conversations. Um, and then if you're using the pupil workbooks, if you're using your own kind of scrapbooks, um, highlights, document this work and highlights and elements of the work that you develop um, could be kept as a resource to then feed into what you do next, um, how you respond to one of the challenges um help you work out you know what materials you really do want to work with like oh we really wish we we work with that plastic bag let's do that next time or think about the materials uh, you want to avoid working with or what tools are missing what techniques you might use to um 
revisit how you use materials or change how you use materials. Um, thinking about the contrast in your work. Um, if I wanted to revisit this again, how could I do something involving the techniques of weaving and wrapping using completely different materials? Um, and then through those moments of revisiting, start to put that into words, use the prompts to put, put this into words, into notes, um, capture it for your um, resources and um, your workbooks, but also capture it um, to give context to your um, submissions. If you do submit for the um, competition, when, when um, you're ready to submit, um, all of these processes, all of these steps um, give depth to the context for the work you've created. Um, just to wrap up, um, Barbara, I thank you for adding, I, I'm sharing that you like the back of your piece rather than the front, using tangle threads and cellophane. I love that. And especially um, around embroidery, I'll show you the back of mine. It's, it's a total mess. Um, there's so much fear and stress. <laughs> Whenever I teach embroidery, people have, there's so many people who believe the back has to be as neat as the front. And um, there's, I guess there's a school of thought or someone somewhere taught them that. Um, but like I said, uh, it's, it's not about perfection. And I love that you're embracing the back rather than the front um, because that you might turn something over and find out, well, that's actually more interesting to me than what I was working on. And there's a different pattern or something hidden that I wasn't expecting. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for um, following along with me. Um, there's there's um, an area, there's a section of the suggested um, learning schemes that invites this kind of free make, but you could do it with any materials, like I said. You could also do it with some prompts around um, techniques or things you know the um, pupils might engage with, but instead of teaching them those techniques, give them, uh, say, clay and an example and, and invite them to kind of problem solve and work with the materials and tools to, to work out how someone achieved a technique. Um, there are lots of different ways to use this kind of free making um, approach, uh, which, which takes us out of the kind of step-by-step step, repeat after me. Um, but yeah, thank you. I think we're about to take a break. Um, I would invite you to continue to make use of anything you're working on as we go through this, the rest of the session. Um, I'm a person uh, that has ADHD and having hands-on activities while I'm in meetings that I need to focus in really helps me focus and think, uh, sort of like a fidget toy, but, but not. Um, but, you know, for other people, it might be too, uh, too distracting, um, but continue to play with the work, see how it impacts how you take in the session, how you focus, how you feel. Um, and, and yeah, um, thank you for uh, bearing with me and, and taking part. And I hope something from this uh, goes with you into your sessions going forward. So I'll pass back to uh, Melise for us to, uh, I think we're going to take a break. Thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely fantastic. And it's interesting as well, because directly in front of me, when you said, you know, what, what we're making, I had paper. <laughs> so I actually used, yeah, the, your, the philosophy behind not, not being afraid to fail and it, it just being materials that you find around you. And it's quite therapeutic as well. And I thought, how nice would it be if I could connect sort of like your conversations are kind of landed on these pages so yeah thank you so much for a really lovely activity um we are now going to take a 10 minute break um so uh feel free to stretch grab a cup of tea um and continue working on your project and then when we come back we will hear from our key stage three winners from last year and get to see and take a little glimpse into their process as well Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, just to remind you, if you haven't changed your names already, could you just please make sure that you're, you've got your first name and your last name of the lead teacher and the school or education setting that you're from. It helps us with registration and the whole evaluation process. So we really appreciate it. 
Okay, I am thrilled to introduce Sonia uh, from Belfair's Academy. Um, and they were the winners from the Key Stage 3 Challenge last year, and they submitted a really fantastic collaborative submission um, that we're really excited to share with you today. So, Sonia, when Hello. you're ready. Can you hear us okay? Fabulous. So I'm here also with my colleague, Helen, who actually ran um, this project with our DT club. Um, so she was our sort of main teacher. And um, I'm going to try and go through sort of the projects and um, go through the slides. So we did this as an after school club. Um, and obviously going through with like the make first philosophy, we often find in our departments where um, a school, obviously this is our key stage three submission, but um, students love our subject because of the making and we enjoy that process obviously a lot ourselves um, so we do put a lot of making within our curriculum so they know that when they come into these extracurricular activities that that's going to be a big part of it and that's what other students really enjoyed and we had um it was a fairly small group but a very committed group um including students with SEN needs as well so it's it's always been a popular club for those guys um so they started thinking about our local area. Um, so we do live by the sea. Um, and so they were looking at sort of ocean waste. So they did a lot of brainstorming, didn't they? They did, yeah. And we set them on a little challenge to go to, to the beach and go and see what they could find. So a little beach hunt to start off, which gave us a good idea of what kind of materials to work with from that perspective. Um, and so then after that, they were looking at sort of ideas and they came up with the idea, um, obviously, of this sort of flat pack disaster shelter um, and thinking about the materials that they found and what they could reuse. Um, and that led them into plastics. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Fabulous. So these were some of the ideas of a very simple sort of shelter um, design. Um, they worked with some CAD as well to build their CAD skills to look at this. Um, but to see something very simplistic that could be obviously produced on a much bigger scale. Obviously, we were working with our small sample. Um, and again, it was interesting going back through thinking about that sort of failing to become a braver maker um, because they did a lot of experimentation didn't they? Yeah we did we worked with all sorts of materials um, to see how things could fit together so we have a little uh, wooden model as well and we tried some driftwood and all sorts of things but with the plastic when they experimented we found out we could get it really nice and flat and compact and that kind of led into their their piecemeal uh, shelter fitting together quite nicely. If we could go to the next slide, we've got um, just some visuals to show you of the students working, um, cutting up all of the, the sort of bottle tops and plastics that we collected and the ones that we were working with that we found were a bit more successful. But as you say, it was about really uh, practicing and, and failing to, to come up with what was going to be the most uh, successful within those slides. It was simple things like how long you could melt the plastic for and um, there's certain plastics we couldn't use um certain plastics that worked a lot better than others and it was just experimentation with sizes how long we could melt it what happened do we how do we get the pattern in the plastic um could we swirl it could we marble it could we sort of manipulate it and so there's loads of experiment just once we'd come up with that concept so if we go to the next slide we just show um sort of for our process, as I say, putting it into the oven and the sort of, sort of formulation of those plastics within the different moulds that they'd been trying. Um, and as you can see, we've got the the CAD drawings, sort of the working drawings. So this could be quite easily scaled up um, as well for, for actually becoming a shelter. And then if we just look on that last slide, if, if we can go one more then this was their sort of scale model of that final idea of how that fitted together. And I think what's quite beautiful about this is you, you can really tell the use of waste materials into a new material because of the colours of different plastics that they've moulded into that as well. So it was a really successful sort of final outcome, I think. It was, yeah. We could Because it was such a small model, we couldn't get the final concept of how it fitted together and everything but the actual idea is is there and we we could do that in other ways to, to show that 
And so that's uh, hopefully we've kept to our five minutes quite well to show um, our whole process for how we've done that project. You've done brilliantly. Thank you. It's so inspiring. I also really like the way that you've presented all your information. You've got really clear images and statements from the children and you can really see the whole process. Um, so I hope that has inspired and yeah, given some support to teachers who yeah, are willing to get this hit hit the ground running with this. So thank you so much, Sonia uh, and, yeah. and Belfair's Academy. I think that's Brilliant. just so it's so wonderful to see those two approaches to make that side by side. Yeah, <laughs> they're so yeah different. Your um... project that really embraces that CAD approach. You know, lots of design in there too, but also really thinking about materials, thinking through making alongside Chris's kind of free making approach with that workshop. Yeah. I think is really exciting and really shows. The potential for make first to work in all sorts of different contexts so thank you so much for sharing that yeah absolutely now support for teachers is at the heart of craft school um we have got a range of digital resources online uh, to support you every step of the way. So on our website, you'll find digital resources, which include videos, videos of the makers in their studios. Uh, this could be the start, the stimulus for a whole make activity. Um, and you'll get to take a close look at the artists working in their intimate space and just gain some insights into how they approach the different briefs. We also have got a workbook that supports you to work throughout. Uh, your student workbook, which gives you prompts and questions to help really get some critical thinking around how your students approach the uh, Make First and the three briefs. And also we've got CPDs and teacher support sessions. Now, our CPD sessions um, are led by artists and they each focus on specific points of the brief so the first one that we have coming up um, is on Tuesday the 19th of November and we've got Lakat Rasul who will be looking at reclaiming and reusing materials um, uh, followed by Ophelia Dos Santos who's going to be looking at creative mending and I wanted to bring your attention to the Thursday the 27th of February 2025. Um, some of you may have seen in, in our previous correspondence that we've written the 20th. Please make sure that you've noted the, the date change there. Um, who, uh, yeah, is going to be led by multidisciplinary artist Sam Ayer. So lots of really exciting opportunities, a bit like the one that we've seen today. The makers talk, make through their, uh, talk through their process. We get to make with them. And it's really crucial that you come together too to share your practice, share your ideas uh, and keeping the sessions um, really supportive for you. Which also leads me on to designated support sessions that we have. Um, throughout the challenge, we will have points of contact where you can come to these support sessions, uh, share your practice, ask some questions, tell us what's going well, what's not going well. And it's a, it's a really supportive, informal environment for all of us to come together and just share practice. The sessions will be um, based around sort of how what, and how and what Make First looks like in your classroom, how you're using the workbook, the judging criteria, the submission process, uh, evidencing, using photographs and exploring craft related careers as well. So um, pencil these in. Our first teacher session is going to be on the 11th of November and I hope to see all of you there. Which leads us to our final section of um, of our launch today and that's just hearing from you. So if you have any questions or comments that you'd like us to discuss or answer, then please do pop any uh, of your comments in the chat box. We'll keep an eye on that. Mm -hmm. um, and in the meantime, I just wanna say a huge thank you to our speakers and our presenters. Uh, it's fantastic to hear and, and watch your practice. So we'll see if we've got any questions in the chat. Before we say our goodbyes for now, um, please do take some time to uh, scan the QR code and leave us um, a little evaluation. It will take you to a form 
if you don't have your phone nearby, don't worry, we'll we'll send over the form as well. But it's really important for us um, to receive your feedback. And it really does mean a lot for future events and the teacher support sessions to hear from you.